Great. Well, thank you so much um, uh, for, to AEA for putting this session on the program and to UHA for organising, to Paul for chairing and to JF for um, discussing a, a very um, PhD grad programs um, in admissions this year. He's fantastic. So this project was motivated by conversations um, that we had um, around uh, sort of in the late um, 2000s um, or noughties, um, uh, we started seeing um, news articles pop up about large retail chains going bust and closing a lot of their stores. So uh, there we always have some churn in the retail industry as in any industry, but these chain store exits haven't been backfilled by new openings. So here you have data from 2016 and 2017 showing that exits outpaced entries to the order of, uh, you know, two or 3,000 stores in each of those years. What they have been backfilled by, however, is the growth in e-commerce activity. So increasingly there is an increased um, amount of variety um, available online and uh, um, consumers are in increasingly purchasing online. And uh, what we see here is that from a fairly small base um, that was documented by Ali and Chad, um, we actually have some you know, decent acceleration of uh, um, e-commerce activity with the uh, um, e-retail or e-commerce accounting for about 12% of uh, um, retail sales in, at the beginning of 2020. So one of the things um, uh, that really is motivating this, um, this study is the fact that we have a brick and mortar retail chains going out of business and stores closing. We have an increasing availability or engagement in e-commerce potentially to compensate for that. Um, those losses, that loss in- I forgot that Jesse talks about. Um, now, what the paper, the, the unique feature of the paper is to point out that this trend, so the increase in variety, lower prices, really favors consumers who have access to online spending, to online online commerce. And since you need a credit card to buy at Amazon, uh, you know, that kind of might leave behind a certain group of households who don't have access to, to credit cards. Uh, and, and credit card is just a proxy. You could think about you know, uh, permanent address, you know, place to store goods, you know, so there's uh, technology restrictions that might uh, favor richer households. So the question that the paper addresses, to what extent this, this decline in traditional retailing will amplify eventually consumption inequalities that we already see, okay? So both in access and, and perhaps prices because you don't have access to, to you know, you're not able to shop as much. Uh, so since the paper is very early, so I'm going to use the opportunity to sort of point out, you know, a few things that I think are important about these trends, uh, and I'm sure some of these are already in the hands of the of the author. So uh, I guess this is mostly a guide of what I think is important. Uh, so one question, more technical question about the data, I wasn't quite. So one one important feature of the data is to be able to uh, measure online spending, and 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 they do it both ways. You know, using a cell phone where you see. Uh, visit at, at, at brick and mortar stores, but also credit card where you see actual online spending, which is, a, which is really nice. Uh, now, the, the premise of the paper is that, you know, people without a credit card uh, cannot shop online. One thing that I'm a little bit worried about is if you measure traffic using cell phone, uh, how many households with, with a smartphone don't have a credit card? So the, the cell phone data might underrepresent uh, the consumption of, of the really poor households. So this is something that might be important to document. Uh, the other thing, and, and this is mostly what I'm gonna talk about next is, uh, as Jesse was, was saying, there, there's this concurrent trend in the data that was documented by, you know, among others by Vartax and Severson, that, that access to brick and mortar stores has actually improved for, for poor households uh, because of the rise of superstores and discount chains, okay? And so, We've, especially in the first 15 or the first half of the 2000s, we've seen large gains in productivity due to relocation. So closures of, of JCPenney as benefit, you know, uh, Sam's Clubs and, and Costco. And, and these trends tend to favor poor households uh, because they, they, they tend to cater, cater to those guys. So I'm going to say something maybe a, a bit controversial, counter to the, the thesis of the papers that, well, maybe what we're seeing, we're expecting is actually a, a, a retail desert for the rich. 
and so return the set for the form. Uh, so here, so I'm, I'm gonna use data that, uh, that we use in a paper with uh, Katia Sai and Peter Newberry. So uh, one, one fact, uh, and this is related to one graph that Jesse was showing, is that the chains that actually increase uh, the last, over the last 10 years uh, tend to favor poor households. So there's this you know, really big negative correlation between the presence of dollar stores and, and, and the income of the county. Uh, the same is true for Walmart, the same is true for, for warehouse clubs. So you see this, this, uh, this thing here, uh, Target is the exception where Target tar targets the richer households. But to, some, to, to a large extent, large fast growing, large productivity gain chains are present in poor neighborhoods. So just based on that, you, you know, the chains that poor households shop at have actually increased in spending uh, in presence. Uh, now, there's also this other thing that, I don't know if it's uh, well-documented or not, but uh, it is true that early on, there was a really large spending gap and, and uh, an accessibility gap in online spending between rich and poor. So this is using Forrester data on the property of making online purchase. Uh, so group four is your top quartile, but that gap has shrunk considerably over the last 10 years. Uh, there's still a gap between the very poor households and, and the others, but there's really not that much of a gap between rich households and middle class and lower middle class. Okay, the, the, the paper of course is focused on the very low end of the distribution where there is still a gap in the property of buying online, but, but the, the, the trend is you know, overall has been quite uh, intriguing. And the same trend is, is even more pronounced for, for age. Uh, and of course, if you have parents above 70, you've seen that, you know, uh, the, you know, the property of buying online has, has, shrink, has increased considerably for, for older households. Now, interestingly, that, a, that income gap doesn't, mature, that hasn't shrunk or is still very much present at Amazon. So Amazon is quite the exception in, some, in many respects. So Amazon targets the rich, into, if you focus on that. Uh, so this is data from Comscore, to conditional making a purchase. This, you know, richer household spends a lot more at Amazon than, than poor households. Uh, the gap is between very poor and middle class is less, but, uh, but, but there's still a really big gap and that gap hasn't closed. Uh, if you look at other chains, you do see something that looks a little bit more like what you would expect from, from brick and mortar or regular purchase. So the income gap at, at Walmart online uh, is not really present, okay? So what you see is, in fact, just like what you expect uh, at retail stores, uh, richer households are much less likely or spend a lot less at Walmart online than the than poor household, although that's not super significant. Uh, target, you know, consumers spend a little, rich consumers spend more target than poor households, but, but, the, but you don't see the same pattern at Amazon. So Amazon, there's this monot large monotonic gap between uh, poor and, and rich. So again, this is something that to think about how, you know, how, do, how the model can rationalize these things, but there's something, you know, since Amazon uh, sells about 50% uh, of online spending goes to Amazon, it's important to understand why there's these, these differences uh, in terms of the income, income gaps between these, these retailers. And that's it. I don't know how much time I had, but I think, I think that's, that's all I had. No, you're good. Uh, so we have like four minutes for Q and A. You got a few questions there, Jesse, in the Q and A. If you want to address those or the discussion. I don't know if we lost Jesse. Seems like we did. I guess we'll, maybe we'll catch up at the end and uh, we'll go ahead and move to our next speaker then, uh, which is uh, Yuhei. Um, and you're going to start a recording, I believe. Very much. Uh, thank you very much. I, I'm gonna uh, uh, start the recording, uh, which means that I can, if there's any clarifying questions, I can uh, respond on live. All right. So let me get started.
Right, so I'm going to talk about consumer mobility and special farm entry. And this is a joint work with Steve Brett. The markets for consumption goods and services are crucial elements of cities. However, there's a growing public concern for an equal special farm entry within a city. This is perhaps most represented by the concern of food and retail desert, where farms are underrepresented in low income neighborhoods. And there's a growing academic literature including Jesse and Rebecca's work. However, what we don't understand well in this and purpose important in this context is the role of consumer mobility. And by consumer mobility, I mean the presence of travel costs. If consumers can easily travel around within the city, an equal special firm entry is not going to be a concern. And I also mean that trip chaining patterns of consumers. Consumers can stop by at multiple locations on the route which gives firms incentive to cluster together. So the question that we want to understand in this paper is first, how does consumer mobility pattern affect the spatial distribution of firm entry? And second, how does endorsement firm entry affect consumer welfare? And third, can place-based policies such as entry subsidy improve consumer welfare? So more concretely, what are we doing in this paper? We start by documenting some patterns of consumer mobility and special farm entry using smartphone data and highlight the presence of travel costs and trip chains. And we develop a spatial equilibrium model where consumers choose a sequence or itinerary of neighborhoods to visit for shopping and monopolistically competitive firms enter in different locations as a response. We theoretically study the distribution and efficiency property of free entry equilibrium. And perhaps surprisingly, we show that equilibrium is Pareto efficient despite the presence of travel costs and trip chains. At the same time, we show that there is a potential distributional concerns, depending in particular the degree can depend on the scope of consumer mobility. So to quantify uh, this, these implications, we structurally estimate the model. And one challenge of this estimate in this model is the high dimensionality of the itinerary choice. And we are gonna uh, provide a new method based on important sampling to handle this issue. And then we use the estimated model to assess how consumer mobility patterns affect the spatial distribution of firm entry and consumer welfare. And in an ongoing work, we plan to quantify the efficiency equity trade-off of place-based entry subsidy. All right, so let me get into the content. The main data we are gonna use in this paper is the smartphone GPS data. The data tracks GPS location uh, of smartphone devices every five minutes from a mapping application in Japan we have a separate paper joined with Nakata and Nakajima, where we show and validate how to extract users' trips or stays, home location, work location, consumption location, locations from this data. You can take a look at uh, that, that draft, which is available on our website. And we complement this data uh, with commercial census data. And we're going to uh, use this data to provide, start by providing reduced form evidence of consumer mobility and spatial firm entry. So using known work states on weekends to proxy consumer shopping itineraries, uh, we show first that consumer shopping locations are spread around the city with a strong tendency to gravitate toward home. So consumers do travel for consumption, but, they, they, um, uh, but there is potentially a travel cost. Second, consumers stop by at multiple locations along the itinerary, forming a trip chain. And lastly, Location with a higher density of retail establishments attract consumer flow, more consumer flow. So perhaps these pieces of evidence um, are not surprising, but they are going to be an important element of, of the model. All right, so let me get to the model. There are multiple locations in the city, and consumers are exactly heterogeneous, obviously with respect to home, but uh, also including including work location, income, or preference. Each consumer decides a sequence of shopping sites to visit, and they're gonna access CS bundles of consumption goods from visiting locations. And on the farm side, each farm sells one differentiated variety to our arriving consumers. Firms enter in each neighborhood by paying a fixed cost, and the marginal and fixed cost can depend on locations, but they are homogeneous within locations and firms are going to set prices following monopolistic competition. 
So let me get into detail, a little bit more detail about starting from consumer's decision. Consumer of type H uh, has an exogenous income EH, and they're gonna choose two things sequentially. First, they choose the ordered subset of neighborhoods to visit, which we label itinerary S, and they're gonna uh, decide the purchase quantity of each variety get under CS utility function. And we're gonna solve these decisions backward. All right, so conditional on itinerary S, the indirect utility uh, based on the consumption choices is going to be given by the, uh, the, 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 X, the income divided by the price index, where the price index is the weighted sum of the price index of each location N included in the itinerary. And the price index of each location N is in turn a function of the number of available varieties in location N and the variety specific price uh, of location N. And this is constant um, within locations because of the assumption of the homogeneous uh, cost structure within location. So by anticipating this indirect utility, consumers are going to choose the itinerary. And to do so, they maximize this, uh, this index, which depends on the indirect utility of, from consumption, the travel cost, and idiosyncratic shock yeah, for each, word, uh, each consumer. And note that this iceberg form of travel cost is, can flexibly depend on consumer type and itinerary. And most importantly, it can embrace the travel cost saving through trip chains, meaning that going to both of the one, location one and two is going to be strictly less than the multiplication of just going to one and just going to two. And for the idiosyncratic shock, we're gonna assume uh, the generalized extreme value distribution, which follows this functional form. Uh, it's hard to grasp, um, but this, uh, as, as a special case, it includes the independent fresh distribution, which is commonly assumed uh, in, in the special equilibrium literature. Okay. And this, uh, but we are, we are, we allow for much more flexible uh, ch choice uh, patterns by allowing for the correlation of epsilon across different itineraries. Okay. So this allows for uh, rich substitution across different itineraries. And that we are going to denote the probability that S is chosen by type H by lambda. All right. So on the firm side. Because of the monopolistic competition with CS utility, um, the, the price is going to be a constant markup where CN is going to be the, uh, is, is the marginal cost. And to enter in location N, firms have to rent one, one unit of floor space at price FN. Okay. For now, we are assuming for presentation, we are assuming that this is exogenous, but in the paper, we uh, relax this to uh, endogenous um, by assuming the floor space supply and the main implication of the paper does not change. And in the free entry equilibrium, the profit is going to be completely offset by the fixed cost. All right, to sum up, the free entry equilibrium is characterized by the consumption amount for each variety, the itinerary choice probability, price, and firm entry, which satisfy consumers' op optimality condition, firms' optimality conditions, in the labor market or factor market clearing. All right, so having characterized the equilibrium, we now study the efficiency property of the market allocation. And to do so, we, um, we define the social planners problem. Social planners are going to determine the entry of uh, firms in each location and the consumption amount of each variety for each type of consumers and itinerary but we assume that social planner cannot observe the idiosyncratic shock epsilon. So what they do is to maximize the expected sum, sum of the expected utility where chi H is the Pareto weight for each consumer type H. And we call the allocation is globally efficient if the allocation is a global maximizer of the social planner's problem and locally, locally efficient if it is a local maximizer. So here is the main uh, proposition of, of the paper, theoretical part of the paper. We show that free entry equilibrium 
uh, with positive entry is always locally efficient. And moreover, implied Pareto weights are given by chi-star, which is the ratio between the income and the expected utility of type H consumers in the equilibrium. Okay. So perhaps the, the most important implication of the, of the proposition is that iceberg form of travel cost entry chains are neither necessary or sufficient for Pareto efficiency. And this is contrary to the presumption in the literature that trip chains can potentially induce market distortion. And very quickly on the intuition, there are no misallocation within location, meaning there's no uh, misallocation between entry and consumption of each variety within each location, similarly to the logic of classical results by Dixon and uh, Stiglitz with monopolistic competition and the CS utility. At the same time, there are no misallocation across locations because market equalizes mar marginal expected utility across itineraries. So social planner does not have incentive to reallocate the resources across different itineraries or different locations. At the same time, we also show that there's a po po possible distributional concern um, if Pareto weights chi star are not as desired. And if you think about this, this is almost certainly the case because the implied Pareto weight is a function of the equilibrium, okay? uh, extra equilibrium utility. Okay, so um, now we're gonna um, study the quantitative implication of, uh, of the, uh, the positive and normative implication of the model. And we start by uh, parameterizing the model to take the model to data. So we first assume that consumer type H is only characterized by the residential location. We're gonna assume preference shocks follow IID fresh distribution with the common dispersion parameter theta, which is going to give the itinerary choice by this logit form. The travel cost is going to be, uh, be given by the fixed cost for each stop and the total travel time starting uh, from home and uh, following the itinerary S and eta and rho are the parameters. So now, one challenge of estimating and simulating this type of model is the dimensionality problem of the itinerary choice. To see this, again, this is the choice probability. If you look at the denominator, in order to compute this probability or likelihood, you have to sum up all the possible itineraries. Okay? If there are 100 locations, uh, the possible itinerary choice uh, that, that people can choose is 100 to 100, which is going to be impractical to, 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 to compute. So we are going to introduce important sampling method to handle this issue. The idea is very simple. We are going to introduce auxiliary distribution FH, and we are going to sample from this one, which we, we denote PHSH. But this is different from, from different distribution as the true likelihood. So we're gonna wait for each sample by the likelihood ratio. So the one attractive feature of this method is that we can choose any arbitrary auxiliary distribution FH, as long as they have a common support with a true likelihood lambda. But in practice, as they are close to each other, the approximation is better. Uh, and we in, introduce in this context, we show that my, myopic sequential choice is going to give a good approximation. All right, so equipped with a simulation strategy, we're going to estimate the parameters by simulated method of moment and using the data of smartphone GPS data of shopping itinerary choices and commercial census uh, information about spatial distribution of firms. These are the estimated parameters. Uh, one caveat is that spatial unit is given now defined by uh, municipalities, which is relatively large, and we are now uh, 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 now trying to get, get it finer. All right. So using the estimated model, we are gonna um, we're gonna uh, conduct a sequence of counterfactual simulations to highlight the role of consumer mobility on spatial uh, farm entry and consumer welfare. And in particular, we're going to provide counterfactual simulation under hypothetical assumptions of consumer mobility. First, 
we assume that consumers can still visit multiple locations, but they cannot form a trip chain, meaning that they have to go back home for each destination. And second, we assume that consumers can visit only a single location out of all locations in the city. And third, we assume that consumers can only consume at their residential locations. We're going to uh, study these uh, three hypothetical scenarios um, for, uh, for, for two types of counterfactuals. One is to fix firm entry and study how consumer welfare measure changes. Okay, and so this kind of factual exercise is going to highlight how we are, our estimates of the consumer welfare is going to be biased if we ignore the patterns of consumer mobility. And second, we are gonna allow for endorsement firm entry. And this uh, kind of factual is going to highlight how consumer mobility affects the pattern of spatial firm entry. Okay. So let me start with the first one. So here we are showing the median and quantiles of the expected price index by residential location in baseline in the kind of action scenarios. We expected uh, price index is, uh, is taking the expectation across all possible itinerary. Okay. Uh, for, so this is the baseline, these are the kind of factual. As you can see, price index is predicted to be substantially higher when consumers are incorrectly assumed to consume at their residential locations in particular. So in other words, incorrect assumptions of consumer mobility leads to biased estimates of consumer welfare. So in the second account of factual, we endorse an as fine firm entry. So here, what we are plotting is on the x-axis the firm density in the baseline of the, in the, uh, the, what is observed in the data, and the firm density in the counterfactual. Yeah, and uh, kind of four, and the three different uh, counterfactual scenarios. As you can see, firm density is much flatter across space when consumers are again incorrectly assumed to consume at their residential locations. Okay, so these purple dotted plots. So in other, uh, in other words, uh, consumers travel outside residential location is an important driver of spatial concentration of firm entry. So let me briefly conclude. This paper is about studying how consumer mobility shape spatial firm entry and consumer welfare. And in an ongoing work, we are trying to increase spatial resolution and that is likely to uh, increase the role of trip chains um, at the finer spatial scale. And also, we highlight efficiency equity trade off from place based entry subsidy. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, Pan Laser discussed. So, I'm going to talk about consumer mobility and spatial firm entry. And okay, can you see my screen? Yep. Perfect. Okay, thank you for the organizer. Actually, thank you, Yuhei, for you know um, inviting me to discuss the paper, which I have really enjoyed reading. I realize seven minutes is very short, so I'm just going to cut the you know cut to the bone. Um, this is a very creative exercise using location information from mobile phones, and it contributes to emerging literature that exploits a fine spatial resolution and high frequency nature of the mobile phone data. So here is a list, you know, of recent literature on this, and you know the the first paper by this also exploits the mobile phone data. What is what is creative about this exercise is that most of the other studies, you know, without um, bringing additional data on P and Q present quantity, this is actually this exercise uh, exercise is able to exploit modeling assumptions to talk about wave analysis. I'll get to this you know, in a second, which I think is actually quite creative. And second is it documents interesting stylized facts, you know, uh, used in the Tokyo metropolitan areas. So that that's where the data comes from. Um, I, I, I think some of those, actually, these are quite intuitive. And uh, one thing is I like the direct evidence of trip chains. You know, this is unlike some of the other papers where trip chains is inferred. This is exactly looking at the same phone over time, every five minute interview, you know, interval where you are. So I actually quite like this evidence on trip chains. And what I, the a quick question here is I'm a little puzzled that the weekday trips seem to have a similar pattern as weekend trips. As you can see, you know, the, the per day stays, which is essentially the, the, the places where you stop, 
uh, it's somewhat similar. I, I guess this is something that um, I think uh, maybe the author could elaborate on in a future iteration. And it also has, so the, as you can see, the model is quite rich. You know, it is, it is a very rich theoretical model from quantitative ur urban models where it combines consumer shopping trips and, you know, firms' uh, um, spatial distribution. And it also has a general equilibrium where the you know, labor market also clears. It incorporates, you know, many layers of heterogeneity, okay? You have seen that consumers differ in home, income, you know, type, the firms differ in location. Um, there's also equilibrium, you know, the quite quite rich set of equilibrium objects. And I think this is a great, uh, also it has a clever application of an important sample to deal with a high dimensionality problem. And the fitness, you know, the model fits actually amazing if you look at you know, the, the tables in the paper for such a stylized model. So I think this is, you know, quantitative models, which I've come to realize are actually doing pretty well at fitting the data. Okay, uh, and and lastly, you know, looks at the welfare consequences and find that if we uh, restrict consumers to shopping at, at their residential locations, you know, it's going to hurt them, you know, by a substantial amount, forty percent or, or could be more. And ongoing work on any subsidies. So let me just talk about a couple of comments I have. The first is um, travel cost. This um, I think here the the travel cost assumption is a little stylized and potentially could benefit from a little more um, you know, flexible uh, specification. So this is the travel cost. The travel cost is actually slightly different from our notion. It's a scalar of the utility. And you know, I understand this setting is actually very difficult to have the additive travel cost. Uh, but so taking that, uh, uh, having that in mind, the travel cost is the number of trips times the, the distance and the the distance has a coefficient of beta, which basically ca captures, you know, if you travel a longer distance, perhaps the travel cost doesn't increase as much, right? Here, I'm struck by the fact that this travel cost, uh, the coefficient for, for distance is very small, which I see, I take that as evidence that perhaps distance, the physical distance, perhaps is not first order. And so, so I was wondering whether this would be an area that you can relax this or be more flexible about this distance measure to incorporate, you know, time of traveling, subway connections, or maybe car ownership. You know, I understand in Tokyo, you know, this is, might not be relevant, but I'm just struck by any other factors that could, you know, make the travel not just um, one dimensional by distance. And second, eta is very large. Essentially, if you make a second stop, the travel cost increased by four, you know, three times, four times. And so I, this is, could be largely driven by a you know, very large sigma, you know, you love variety and to offset, to fit that data where people don't make many, many 10 trips or 20 trips a day, you have to have a large eta. So I, I was wondering whether you know, what, what would happen if you let the sigma play with the different values of sigma? I'll come back to this uh, in a second. And also maybe given that many trips, the trip chains are not very long, maybe you can actually you know, restrict the number of stops. This would also help with the dim dimensionality problem. And lastly, I think the model fit, you know, the model that's a great fit overall, but the number of trips is actually not very good. So I think Consumer heterogeneity potentially could be relevant, but having said that, you know I'm quite aware in this kind of urban models, this is very hard. So you know, so I, I think that the if you're able to relax this, in particular in a measure of D, that might you know help. And second, welfare. This is actually the part that I think I approach in urban quant is, is, is are so quite different uh, for subtle issues. So if, if if I were to do an you know, IO approach like what the paper you know presented by Jesse, and we're going to basically observe quantity and, and price, right? Variation in price and quality will help us to get back uh, get at welfare with supply side assumptions to, in order to get at the supply cost, cost of production, or cost of selling goods. And we pay a great deal uh, to the price endogeneity and preference heterogeneity. Uh, but in this setting here, I think if you look at the moments that identify the parameters are largely based on this variation trip or travel distance, number of trips or number of states, and number of consumers visiting each location. So I actually am, I'm curious, why didn't you ask them? You already have the model, the model already predicts the quantity, which sorry, the sales. Why not bring that data, which you observe the sales you know at each uh, location might be good to bring that uh, 
moment back into the estimation to discipline the parameter. And that might help you to get some of the price, you know, analog of the price coefficient, which is theta and sigma. Right now, the sigma is calibrated. So I wonder how, how the results will differ if you have different values of, of sigma. And lastly, the, you know, the nesting parameter theta here, which is governs the elasticity of substitution, you know, we know that you know, the non-parametric estimation of this requires variation in choice or changes you know, across, uh, across individuals. You might want to bring that discussion you know, to, uh, in, a, in a paper. And, and some of the extensions I already talked about. So in this paper here, you know, as I mentioned in the Iowa approach, we pay a great deal of attention to endogeneity, which essentially means there are arms of quality, arms of amenities, you know, luxury or discount shopping, shopping malls. It might, I think I would love to see a little extension on that front to incorporate more of uh, the differences across, you know, across uh, districts. And lastly, the fact that, you know, I, I really like this elegant result, which says market equilibrium is deficient, but this is also by construction in a sense that it's a result of, you know, CES, you know, you're extending the existing literature to show, you know, even if with travel costs, you know, with trip change, you still have the efficient outcome. But I wonder, this obviously will be an entirely different paper. I wonder, you know, how crucial is a CES and how, you know, how, how, how important, if we relax the CES, like the recent GP paper by um, Vera and Morrow, you know, how would it be relevant for our welfare analysis? And uh, I think that's all, thanks. Did I over, did I, uh, was I good on time? No, that's perfect, that's perfect. Um, so we have about five minutes for Q&A, but we don't have any questions in the chat this moment. Um, if you wanna react to the discussion, that would be great, or we can move on to you. Uh, yeah, so uh, th uh, thank you, Pamela, uh, a lot for, for a very uh, nice and very inspiring comment. Let me um, respond, um, you know, given the time, let me respond a couple of points. Um, so one broad point about the importance of the elasticity of, um, of substitution sigma, uh, you are exactly right that this is important. You know, this parameter crucially affects the estimates of other parameters, as well as the estimates of the, uh, the variation of uh, welfare inequality. Um, and you are also right that there's a possibility to, by, by, uh, to, to estimate this parameter by bringing in other type of data. Um, price times quantity is not that helpful, um, although we've tried a little bit. Um, what we actually need is price, um, and price is not available um, at the final spatial scale, as, as I guess, um, as, as you know, this audience is sympathetic about this. Um, uh, but but I, I take your general point about the importance of this issue. Um, so we'll we'll think about uh, about this, um, and um, yeah, very quickly on the weekday versus weekends. Um, the number of uh, states are similar um, uh, in, in the smartphone data of the number of states uh, on weekday the weekdays versus weekends. Um, so in a separate paper, uh, we studied the interaction of uh, commuting trips and consumption trips, and actually. Um, on during weekdays, uh, a lot of stays are for commuting. So for if you look at the consumption trips, it's much more clustered around weekends. Uh, let me also advertise that uh, Steve Redding, my co-author, is going to present and Rebecca is going to uh, thankfully discuss the paper in a later session today, which I'm going to be asleep. Um, but hope if you're interested, it's going to start at <laughs> 3 45 p.m. EST. Yeah, uh, the paper is the model is very rich. So I just want to give you know give the fair credit. I hope I, I didn't sound too critical. Um, Great. Our our uh, third speaker is Gunter Hitch. So if you're ready to go, why don't you go ahead? And, um, I guess I'll give you a night. Um, I I just realized I somehow I can't share my video. I I changed uh, computers in the middle of a session and. Uh, uh, but it doesn't allow me to apparently start my video. Can, can, are, are you able to fix this, Paul? Let me see. I guess you can hear me. That's a uh... change role. It says your, well, it doesn't allow me to change your role. Only to, can, I can only change your role to an attendee. I sent a chat message to the SSAs. Okay. Oh, wait, there we go. Um, for starters, um, I hope you can see my, 
Yep, you're good. Uh, you good. can see my slides. Yeah, you're good. I'm having the same problem. Judy did something to change my role and it worked. No, I didn't. I just saw that the helper changed your yeah. role and told you. <laughs> uh, and Paul, I can't see the chat window right now, so you just need to shut me up. Uh, but okay. I'll, I'll, let you means. Means. <laughs> I'll let you know when you got like three minutes. To All go. right. Yeah. Bummer. I, I, I dressed up extra properly for the session. So it's like, I, I think it is working now in the chat. It said she, they fixed it. Try to share now. Here we go. All right. So, well, thank you very much for putting the session together and for uh, in, inviting us. So this is a relatively late stage paper. What I mean is it has been around for a while. Um, it, it, it's conditionally accepted and uh, we're doing a final rewrite based on uh, some very uh, available reviewer feedback that the paper, the way it's written is kind of a monstrosity. So uh, we've been trying to improve this and, and you know, the, the feedback I, uh, that we're getting in this session, we can incorporate. So um, the, the, the background to this paper is, um, you know, I'm, I'm a marketing professor at Chicago Booth and I was strongly involved with the with the Kilts Nielsen data very early on before they became available publicly for academic research. And it's data that you know, we, we work with widely in industrial organization, uh, of course, also now macroeconomics and of course marketing. And so the initial idea was just to get some broad understanding of pricing and promotion patterns uh, in, in the data that we have, which here are US grocer retail data. Um, and um, so, so that's the original birth of the paper. And then, you know, we discovered some interesting things and the paper went down certain routes to, to, to kind of think about these interesting things. In particular, what I'm gonna focus on uh, in this presentation is, is the level of price similarity at the market level versus the, um, the, the retail chain level. Um, uh, probably most of you know, uh, you know, close a related paper on price uniformity by Stefano and, and Matt Chensko. Um, uh, also, I should mention probably for, for whatever it's worth, uh, these papers were developed uh, simultaneously. We uh, unfortunately never marketed our paper much, so it's a good opportunity to do that. Okay, so let me, given the limited amount of time, let me ch jump right in. The emphasis here, by the way, is on generalizable results. So we try to work with as many products as possible. Uh, we have about 50,000 UPCs that we analyze in this, this work. So also we're gonna draw a distinction between base prices and promotions. So base prices are the everyday shelf prices. So it's, these are the everyday shelf prices in pink here, and then you see promoted prices in blue. This is one store over several years. Um, you see this here, this is private label milk, which is the largest selling product in most US uh, retailer, at most US grocery retailers. You see this very predictable promotion patterns that are completely changed for two years before the promotion patterns become again more predictable. Just as an aside, there's some incredibly fascinating patterns in the data if once you start looking at them. Uh, with, you know, in detail. Anyway, so we have an algorithm that actually distinguishes between everyday shelf prices and promoted prices. Um, we're still in the process of pa packaging this algorithm as an R package. It's a fairly complicated algorithm uh, that we would like to share. So I'm only gonna show you two facts um, uh, given the limited amount of time to get started with. Basic fact is on the degree of price variability for exactly identical products here, are UPC across stores at a given moment in time. Moment in time is, is, a, is a week. And so what we do is for every single product, we, we measure price dispersion. Here we measure price dispersion based on the standard deviation of the logarithm of prices. So essentially we have a standard deviation that you can interpret as percentage differences from a specific um, geography level mean. And then we summarize these dispersion measures for all the 50,000 products. This here is a revenue weighted histogram over the price dispersion for all 50, close to 50,000 products in our sample. The vertical bar is the median. Um, so this implies that for the median product in our data at the national level, this percentage standard deviation is 16.1%. 
And interestingly, if you go down to the market level, which is uh, probably the more relevant uh, geography here, zip plus free code market level, um, the, the overall dispersion and prices for the median product isn't that much smaller. So one thing we see again and again for overall prices, base prices, promotions is something I call heterogeneity and heterogeneity. There's a lot of heterogeneity in what the price is for the same product across stores. Um, and there's a lot of heterogeneity and to what extent there is price dispersion across different products, very little for some products, a lot of price dispersion for others. Another thing I wanna highlight is, I uh, wanna show you is a, a decomposition of the overall variability of prices into variation in the base prices, the everyday shelf prices and promoted prices. So to make this brief, let's focus maybe on within market results. So what is the relative contribution as a, as a percentage of these different components of overall price variability? So within market actually, but close to half of the overall variability of prices, this is not variability of prices within a year, is due to systematic differences in everyday shelf prices across stores. A uh, smaller component, 18.3%, is due to the, the variability of base prices in the course of a year. This base prices, as I think most of, well, all of you know, don't vary uh, much and are only changed rarely. And the contribution of the promotions is 35%. And actually understanding the contribution of the promotions to the overall price variability requires some thought. So you would think just if you have more promotions and larger promotions that increases the price variance, and that is true, but there's a, also there's a countervailing effect that we call the EDLP versus high low adjustment. EDLP is industry speak for everyday low price and high low is, is a retailer who engages in price promotion. So stereotypically Walmart would be an EDLP retailer, although Walmart is running promotions too. So what can happen is the following, you could have a negative correlation between what is your everyday shelf price and the depth of the promotion and the frequency of the promotion. So think of the EDLP retailer always having the low price and then the high low retailers, sometimes when they run a promotion, they kind of close to match the price of the EDLP retailer. So it means actually once these promotions are run that compresses the price distribution and actually lowers the overall price variance. And this is exactly what we find in the data. There's strong evidence for these EDLP high-low price patterns, um, which actually reduce the overall contribution of price promotions to the overall price variability. So having said that, um, a, a you know very detailed analysis of prices, everyday shelf prices, promotions, frequencies, and all of these kinds of things are in the paper. Uh, nothing I wanna get into uh, further given the limited amount of time I have here. So then what I wanna focus on now is the extent of price variation across geographies versus across retailers. And in particular, we're asking to what extent do prices and promotions, so to speak, cluster at the market or retail chain level? So this is the direct to the starting point of the uniform pricing paper by, by Stefano and Matt. So what we do is we, we take prices and we regress the prices on either market level indicators, retail chain indicators, or interactions of market and retail chains and and the corresponding indicators, just to understand what percentage of the overall price variance is explained by these factors. So let's focus on prices first. Um, if we look at to what extent prices cluster at the zip free level, at the market level, for the median product, 46% of the overall price variance at the national level is explained by systematic price differences at the market level. Uh, interestingly, with chain indicators for the median product, that percentage goes up to close to 70%. And in particular, if I look at chains at the local zip-free market level, um, close to 
for the median product, close to 90% of the overall price variance is explained by chain specific factors. So in other words, um, especially at the local market level, uh, chains have very, very similar prices. Uh, even at the national level, they have relatively similar prices, but there's different pricing zones that we can observe in the data. Very similar uh, facts for promotion frequency, meaning the percent of weeks when a product is promoted and the promotion depth, which is the, defined as the percentage discount um, over the base price a condition on a promotion. So here's our, our take on why potentially these prices and promotions are so similar to chain and especially at the market chain level. And so what we do is we, we well, you know, obvious question is, so to what extent is demand also similar? Um, across markets or across chains or within markets and within chains to be precise. So what we do is we, we take, now we, we analyze the products at the brand level. So if about 2000 brand aggregates here and we estimate like the industry does, we estimate lock linear demand models um, for each brand store separately. So for each brand, we get a price elasticity estimate at the store level we also get a promotion effect estimate at the store level. Promotion here is simply defined as the product promotion, promoted or not. Uh, so a pro promotion is captured as a, as a dummy variable in our data. Okay, so, so we estimate these many, many, many linear regression models either using OLS or using a Bayesian hierarchical model where we put initially a national prior on the distribution of price elasticities and uh, promotion coefficients. And we do that simply to kind of weed out noise, um, essentially to shrink the estimates uh, in, in a rational Bayesian way. And we also do this, and I'm gonna get to this um, soon, because this is actually what kind of in state, in the state of the art in the retail industry does. So there are uh, quant consulting companies one founded in the early 2000s by somebody I knew very well, came as a guest speaker to one of my classes I teach at Chicago Booth many times that uh, did pricing analysis for retailers and manufacturers and they, um, they employed Bayesian hierarchical models. So Peter Rossi, who hired me at Chicago Booth and, and Greg Allen, we actually were um, scientific advisors of this company. Okay, so, um, yeah, there is uh, other controls, including local market specific time fixed effects of separate interest. And the paper has something to say about this, but I'm not going to dwell on it too much here. It's the question whether there's endogeneity and whether we ask them, whether we're actually estimating causal effects. Um, I'm not going to get into a long discussion on this. And uh, one reason is it's also not quite of primary importance for our purposes. Because ultimately what we want to analyze is we want to analyze what does the decision maker managers at the firms see. And the industry practice among sophisticated retailers, and I just alluded to this, is to use shrinkage estimators using Bayesian hierarchical models. Um, these guys use relatively short time series, so typically not more than two years. And uh, IVs are pretty much unknown in the industry practice. As, as, as I might say, as given that we use IVs in, in IO and we should, uh, we don't have particularly good IVs for prices, just my view, also the view of others. All right, so we estimate all of these price elasticities. And now what we do is we have for the brands, we have price elasticities at the store level. Now we ask again the same question, to what extent are these price elasticities and promotion effects similar at the market, the chain or the market chain level. And what we find is qualitatively something very similar to what we've seen before. So here we look at price elasticities, here we estimate them using OS, here we estimate them using this Bayesian hierarchical model, which I'm gonna focus on. So 
There's a lot of variance in the price elasticities. Market indicators explain about 20% of this variance. Chain indicators explain 23%, but chain market indicators explain more than 50% of the overall of the overall variation in price elasticities across stores for the median product. I would say this is a large number given that obviously once you pin down elasticities to the store level with here three years worth of data and we do control for competitor prices and competitor promotions, there's a lot of variance. It's a large error term in this estimate so actually being able to account for 52.3% of the old variance, this is high. Um, similar phenomenon when we look at the promotion effects. So there's clear evidence that demand is much more similar within retail chains and especially retail chains at the local market level um, compared to, to what extent market factors per se explain differences. And, and price elasticities and promotion effects. So um, what, one thing to add, how similar are the elasticities and price effects, sorry, promotion effects that the decision makers, the firms and the managers at these firms see? So I estimated, we estimated the models so far with the national prior and we did that simply not to mechanically shrink the elasticities at the chain level. But of course, in the, re in, in, in the industry practice, the retailers don't have access to all the data. They have access to their own data. And so when a company like IRI or Nielsen estimates price elasticities for them, they use chain level priors. So now we repeat essentially the exercise and we estimate all of these store level price elasticities and promotion effects again, but we do that with chain level priors to simply look at, okay, so it, what are the elasticities and promotion effects that the managers themselves have in front of them and how similar are these? Now, when we do that and we use this chain level prior, is an hierarchical model, it actually turns out that um, chain and market specific fixed effects um, indicators to explain a bit more than 70% of the overall variance in, in uh, price elasticities and 73.5% for store level promotion effects. So that strengthens what I've shown you before that uh, in the sense that if, if you look at the evidence that the decision makers have in front of them, there's a lot, a lot of similarity in price elasticities and promotion effects at the local retail chain level. So uh, it seems, first of all, the puzzle isn't that much of a puzzle once you understand that chains are just, uh, you know, they have very similar demand across different stores at the market level. One more thing that we're asking is the following. So suppose you have a manager now looks at these estimates and says, okay, can I even statistically distinguish them? Or can I tell apart the price elasticity in one of the stores in a local market relative to the market level mean? And so what we do is we ask, well, so for what percentage of stores do the credible intervals based in analog of the confidence in a well, well, Maybe shouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> to what extent do these credible intervals uh, include the chain level market mean? For what percent of stores do, they, do these credible intervals exclude, exclude or include the chain level market mean? And so here, this is for brand price elasticities. If you look at a 95% credible interval, um, only 7.5% of them do not include the market level mean. So you got about 30 seconds left here. Okay. So uh, to make this, this long story short then, uh, if the decision makers said, okay, I'm gonna do something that is akin to, to a frequentist hypothesis test, they would not be able to distinguish between these price elasticities and promotion effects easily. Um, 
do I get one more minute? Sure, yeah. Okay, so ju just to sum this up. First thing, what we do not do in this paper is we don't ask what is the value of store level pricing. The reason is that it's very, very hard to pin down cross price elasticities and especially at the store level, but it's something we should do. Uh, after all, pricing decisions are part of what retailers call category management. Okay, so they do understand uh, that you should manage prices, not individually, but at the category level. So Stefano and Matt uh, do this at the UPC level. Um, so this requires, as I just implied, some strong assumptions. They predict and, and profit increase 16.1 million for the median chain. Um, if, if all the UPCs are, would be price optimized individually. But essentially, so what we're adding to this literature is the following. Look, yes, there is you know, a high degree of price similarity and promotion similarity at the chain level. However, there's also a very, very high degree of demand similarity of the chain level, especially and even more so once you look at the estimates that are available to the chain. So um, the main explanation in Stefano's and Matt's papers is this is managerial inertia. Uh, we're adding something that is not necessarily contradictory, but I think adds a dimension to this explanation. I uh, reread uh, Kevin's paper on zone pricing last night. And, uh, you know, as he points out, right, so um, less granular pricing, meaning not store level pricing, can be quite optimal in the presence of menu costs. And I think here it wouldn't actually take very, very large menu costs. To essentially rationalize this, this uh, you know, the fact that prices are very similar at the market level and not customized to each individual store. Final word: um, location seems to matter less than we thought in retail, uh, based on our results, because the the price list is really cluster at the chain level, and we see in the data chains retail stores that are next to each other and have completely different price elasticities. But these price elasticities mimic the price elasticities that are found in other stores, both at the market level and the chain. So thanks a lot. Great. Uh, Kevin is our discussant. And so we can add that to this compelling list of existing theories of uniform pricing. Uh, the first is I don't want to price discriminate because there'll be a bunch of backlash. Uh, actually, I'm not even sure if we have a lot of evidence of that. It, it's like we estimate a model and we see that uh, firms can do better. We have to attribute it to something, let's call it fairness. Um, another theory is it may be optimal to not price discriminate because it's a game of strategic complements. And if I hard stop at the end, so um, I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca, who's our fourth speaker. I hope. You guys see that? You're good. Great, thanks. So thanks for including us on in the program. Um, our paper is a little bit different. We have retail, but we're not just about retail. Um, this is joint work with Enrico Moretti, and we are trying to study where is standard of living the highest, looking at local prices and geography of consumption. Um, so just to motivate a bit, um, there's been an explosion in the literature highlighting the many different ways through which your place of residence can impact your economic well-being and impact inequality. Um, the older literature here was really focused on earnings differences across space, but now we know much more about the role of intergenerational mobility, housing costs, amenities across space, mortality differences across space, brand preferences, um, and one sort of obvious thing left off this list um, that we think is a key component of utility is differences in market consumption. Um, and surpri maybe surprisingly, we actually don't know that much about how the overall basket of um, consumption varies across space. And potentially one of the main reasons we don't know that much is the main data set on consumption in the US, the Consumer Expenditure Survey, really has severe measurement error issues and very small samples limiting um, sort of more granular spatial analysis. So what are we going to do in this paper? Um, we're going to try to measure where mar uh, market consumption is the highest or lowest and for whom. Uh, to do that, we're going to use a data set which covers about 5% of the US in 2014 
And this is going to include bank account data linked to credit card account data. So for the households in this data set, we sort of see every single line item in there, um, checking and savings account, all the deposits, all the withdrawals, and then all the transactions on their, on their credit cards as well. So this allows us to see very granular information, both about their income and very detailed information about where they're doing all their spending. Obviously, we can't see exactly what they purchase when they make an Amazon transaction, but we can see all the merchant names and where the transactions are occurring. Um, this is going to allow us to do some documenting, some facts about differences in spending and saving differences across space and income. Um, however, that's really sort of incidental to our analysis. We really want to get to consumption. We're not studying too much about expenditure um, and savings per se, but it's a sort of stepping stone we have to get to to actually measure consumption. So to do that, we need to be able to deflate these expenditure differences across space um, so that we can measure quantity of consumption and not just P times Q. So we're going to build local price indices to get everything into a consumption unit as opposed to an expenditure unit. Once we've built these local price indices, which are going to be heterogeneous by different income levels, we can then compare consumption differences across space holding income fixed. So if any, at a given level of income, where is the consumption the highest? But as we know, spend, uh, income differences are not the same across space for a given type of individual. Um, so to make progress there and be able to say, where does a given type of person have the highest consumption? We're going to link our data to data from the American Community Survey, where we can measure income differences across space. And merging these differences together is allow us going to really be able to have a broader you know, picture uh, for a given type of household or given type of individual, where is their income the highest, but at, and which may be a different place than where their consumption is the highest by putting this data together. And then to sort of tie it all together at the end, we're going to sort of do a quantitative um, sort of a calculation in sort of an accounting sense to measure how important are the geographic sorting differences by skill and by uh, location how do they contribute to consumption inequality between skill groups? So we know that like high skill workers live in expensive cities, lower skill workers tend to live in less expensive cities. So to putting all that together, how does that sorting differences difference end up contributing to consumption inequality between those groups? Okay. And one caveat here. So this is a paper studying this one dimension, one specific angle of how space contributes to um, consumption. Obviously utility, includes many things that are not included in consumption. Um, so we are not measuring amenities. So this is not an overall utility metric. Just like the previous papers we talked about, you know, they, some measure mortality, some measure intergenerational mobility. None of those on their own are, are a complete description of utility. We're just trying to go after market consumption. So I, we know that amenities difference across space and that's just not the focus of this paper. All right, so I'll tell you a bit more about our data. Um, we're going to have the deposits and withdrawals from accounts and credit cards that are all linked within the same bank. Um, so there is a potential issue that if there are credit cards at different banks that are not linked in our data set, we can't see them. We do some adjustment for that. Um, we don't seem to find that to be a big issue. Indeed, um, according to the uh, survey of consumer finance, six, two thirds of all households only use one bank at all. So for those uh, households, we sort of have their full uh, detailed uh, consumer activity. For the other third, um, I don't have time to go into it here, but we have ways of documenting their total credit card spending out of their bank account and we can make adjustments for that, um, which don't seem to be a big deal. Um, our data come from a company which provides financial software to banks. And if that company selects in to work with our uh, data provider, then um, that company's uh, users and consumers are visible to our data provider. So selection into our data set is at the bank level, not at the consumer level. So these aren't people like opting in to use like a, you know, consumer finance software or something like that. This is about which banks are contracting with our firm. And indeed, um, our data is, uh, this firm is used by many of the largest banks and 92% of our sample are going to come from five big banks that you've heard of. Um, and then among that enormous set of consumers, we have a random set of active accounts given to us from the by the data provider. Um, to measure income, we just look at deposits into the bank account, excluding transfer from other accounts. Expenditure is going to be all spending out of the bank accounts and on cards, excluding transfers to other accounts and cards. So we sort of deal with all the transfer stuff, which isn't true income, just moving money around. And we end up with pretty clean measures of spending and income. Geography here, we don't know exactly people's home address, but we have the geocoded transactions of where they spend. So we just assume you live in the modal commuting zone of where you transact. And our data is for one year in 2014. 
just to give you a few data descriptive facts, this is comparing the, ag the aggregate um, household um, consumption as we see in our data here. So we find the average household in all our data is spending about um, $85,000. If you compare that to the national accounts, which is sort of the data that goes into GDP, it's a bit higher, which is not totally surprised. Uh, we're not, we're not, we wouldn't expect it to hit it bang on. There are a few things we're missing, like we can't see direct spending out of your brokerage account and things like that. But for the vast majority, we seem to be getting very close. Um, whereas the consumer expenditure survey, which is what people have generally focused on, which is known to have big underreporting issues, it's only getting about 53% of, um, sorry, $53,000 per household. So we're, we're doing much better than the CEX. Um, we're going to make some restrictions on the data. We're going to only look at households that have at least $10,000 of income because the very low income are sort of likely to be unbanked. We have some measurement error issues of some counts that are just not active. So we're just going to chop off the very, very low income and start with $10,000 and go up from there. Um, and I'm going to talk about three income groups throughout the talk. Low income, that means you have at least 10K, no more than 50K of annual income. Middle is 50 to 200 and high is 200 and up. We're going to restrict our analysis to commuting zones. We have at least five households in our data from each income group. That's going to cover 481 commuting zones, which covers about 97% of the population. So we're, we're doing a pretty good job covering um, the whole country. Just to show you our data is representative, this is a comparing the um, income distribution we see in our bank account data compared to what we've seen in the American Community Survey micro data. This is comparing household level income as we think our data really represents households. And you can see it matches very well. The one adjustment we did to, to make this, you know, that helps us make match especially well is we re-weighted our, re our data based on the population weights across different commuting zones. So we have overrepresented some commuting zones based on which banks are present in which areas, but we just do this simple re-weighting population differences across space relative to the actual population. Um, and that then makes everything look very representative. Okay. So our main uh, thing we need to calculate here is a local price index. So to do that, we're going to be starting, our main index is going to be a standard Lesperes index. This is like, you know, a first order approximation to the true price index um, for an arbitrary homothetic utility function. Um, obviously, there's some, you know, issues about uh, how well of an approximation this Lesperes index is about like things like substitution bias. In the paper, we have a large set of robustness where we do many other price indices, but I'm just going to present the Lesperes index today in the interest of time. So what this does, it's going to take for uh, many different categories of good of goods I, so like um, each different category of good is, is indexed here by I. We're going to measure sort of expenditure shares for each of those categories for each income group that we're focused on nationwide. And then we're going to use those expenditure shares as weights to measure prices of each of those goods in each commuting zone. Um, and then this is just basically a weighted average of these prices. And that represents sort of the price that you would have to spend to uh, uh, the amount you'd have to spend to consume a given bundle to hold, to hold your utility fixed um, in each of the different cities. Okay. So there's sort of two things that need to go into that data wise. The first is um, measuring the expenditure shares. So to measure expenditure shares, we're going to piece together a number of different data sources, each of which have um, sort of comparative advantage in different dimensions. So for non-housing expenditure share, so basically everything you buy except your housing uh, spending, we're going to be using our, our credit card and um, uh, bank account data. So there we see for all the transactions, we can see for each transaction the name of the merchant and the data provider has already coded up an expenditure category for each of those merchants. So within the categories that we can uh, measure well, excluding housing, we can measure expenditure shares for each income group just directly in our data when we drop the check and ATM spending. So we're gonna assume implicitly that the check and ATM spending, even though it is included in our total expenditure, it's sort of equally distributed across the expenditure categories that, um, that we do see. So given a non-housing expenditure, we can just read off our own expenditure shares across these categories. The reason we're saying non-housing expenditure here is because housing is actually very hard to measure in our data because if you pay with a check or you um, pay with like a transfer to your to your loan, it's not always flagged very well. Um, so we're going to measure housing expenditure um, in the consumer expenditure survey, which is known to be well reported and reflected. People are pretty good at remembering how much they spend on their rent or what they pay on their mortgage. 
So basically, we're going to take out from the CEX what the people say they spend on um, on housing, and then gross up, um, and then basically sort of make all this um, sort of add up to one. So we know, given non-housing expenditure, what's the expenditure share, and then we know the overall split between housing and non-housing expenditure. So we can sort of add all, put all this up into total expenditure shares. The one place where we can get um, even a little bit more detail is we're going to use the Nielsen data um, for retail. So we, I don't have all of the slides here in the interest of time, but we're going to use Nielsen to get even more granular expenditure shares on all the categories that Nielsen has. So we can get overall retail spending from our data, but then within retail, I can break it down into you know shampoo versus grapes versus yogurts and get those expenditure shares from Nielsen. Okay. Next, um, once we have all these expenditure shares measured, uh, we need to measure prices. Um, so to measure prices, um, again, we're going to be using our uh, sort of three different data sources, depending on the type of good. So for the categories that we were able to measure expenditure shares in Nielsen, we can also get the prices from Nielsen. So Nielsen just directly reports prices, which is super useful for us. So we just measure um, the UPC prices uh, for each uh, product group and we regress those on a commuting zone fixed effect and UPC fixed effects so that we can get a product group by CZ fixed effect, which re represents the price of each different product group in each CZ. So those are the prices um, for all the different retail type goods. And we have like hundreds of different prices for each commuting zone for all the different uh, subcategories of retail. For housing, we're going to use uh, rents, uh, the housing rents that as reported in the American Community Survey. The reason we use rents and not, you know, owner value prices because owner prices also include things like expected depreciation. Rents are really a spot price for the current cost of renting a house. Um, so we're going to take log rents as we see in the ACS and we're sort of hedonically adjust them for beds, your built rooms, and you know, presence of you know uh, facilities like bathrooms and kitchens. And then we'll take out a CZ fixed effect, which will be our um, price for each um, the cost of housing across space. And that for the remaining categories, we purchase data from a company called Acra, which basically goes around and records prices in every commuting zone for things like a doctor's visit or um, uh, a typical hamburger or like a pair of men's slacks. So we have prices for all the whole bunch of other categories that we can include. So all of this together should be a pretty comprehensive bundle of prices um, for your total um, total set of expenditures. And in the interest of time, I could show you lots more information about all those different categories. Um, I'm just gonna cut to the chase and show you the distribution of price indices um, across commuting zones. So we made three uh, price indices. I told you we measured expenditure shares separately by our three income groups, low income, middle income, and high income. Obviously, the prices for any given good are the same across the income groups. It's just the expenditure shares or the sort of underlying utility function is implicitly allowed to, to differ. Um, and one thing to note here is the, the distribution of price indices across income groups are pretty similar. The, the income group's preferences are not that different. But one, uh, what you do see is there's this sort of long right tail of prices. So many commuting zones are kind of clustered all around sort of the median price index. But then we've got these, you know, expensive cities out here, which can get as high as 40% more expensive uh, relative to the median city. Whereas, you know, once you get the bottom city is, you know, about, you know, 20, not even, so it's like 15% uh, less expensive than the median where the most expensive is 40. So you have this sort of skewed distribution. And, you know, these, as you'll see later, these are sort of the usual suspect cities that you might expect. So just to give you some names here, so where I'm located in the San Jose commuting zone, that's the most expensive uh, price index in the country, about 40% more than the median. And the median here is um, Cleveland, Ohio. We've normalized Cleveland to one, um, just to give you a, so a name to that, to that median city. And you can see, you know, these are all like New York and Boston type areas surrounding other parts of California in the very top. The middle is sort of the Midwest, um, and then the least expensive are probably places you may not even heard of. These are more rural areas uh, in the Midwest or in the Great Plains or in the South. Um, but again, you know, all the way at the bottom down here, only about 12% less than the median, where the top is going all the way up to 42%. Now we're going to look at the relationship between average consumer expenditure um, in each commuting zone and the price index. And we have sort of in each column here, this is for the low income group, 
middle income, and high income. And as you can see, for the low income group, as they uh, as look, you know, holding their income fixed and looking in more and more expensive cities, we see their expenditure is actually higher. So they're um, higher income. Sorry, they they spend more in these expensive cities. Which, when you sort of convert that back to um, consumption, they're lowering their consumption in expensive cities, but only like sort of a, a elasticity of 0.9. So they're dissaving more potentially because it's hard to scrape by on sort of some kind of like minimal level of consumption and you only can cut so much. Whereas the middle income and the high income have more or less flat, I mean, these are slightly downward sloping. Um, they sort of expend the similar amounts in more or less expensive cities, which is sort of saying like the budget constraint binds and you're just gonna cut your quantity more or less one for one. Um, in the more expensive cities. But the low income seem to not be able to cut nearly as much. And these changes in quantity, you can also look at true raw data in Nielsen, look at like counts of eggs or counts of deodorants or counts of carbonated beverages. And you can see the quantity is also just falling in these more expensive cities. So this is just raw data, data looking at counts of consumption across many different categories related to the price index. And you see this pattern showing up. So it's not an artifact of like data manipulation. This is in the raw data. Um, next, um, so the, all of that analysis is really just focused on spending differences holding income fixed. Uh, now we're going to allow income to vary across space. To do this, I don't have a lot of time to get into it. We're going to use the American Community Survey data to measure um, pre-tax income differences for a given household type, assuming selection of all only on observables. We have like uh, 17 different dimensions of type, so that it is very granular on how we measure income differences. We plug that into tax sim so we can get post-tax in, post income, which is what we see in our data because the actual income that goes into your bank account is post-tax. We then merge our data by um, linking income and CZ. So basically your type um, doesn't matter for how you spend once you've conditioned on income. We just need to measure the income differences by type. And then we can deflate your expenditure using the price indices I already showed you. So just to... Um, show you a little bit of what this gets us. This is looking at up here are the college grad high school households. So these are the high skill households that um, have at least a, a college degree. And you can see that if you look at their pre-tax income differences across space, they have more, much higher pre-tax income in high, high cost cities. Post-tax income, that relationship erodes a little bit. Expenditure, that relationship erodes, and erodes even more. And then when you go to consumption, this uh, relationship is flat. So basically for high income households, interestingly, the expensive cities and cheap cities actually offer very similar levels of consumption and the income basically differences perfectly offset the price differences. But once you start to get into the middle skill and low skill households, the income, the pre-tax income is also higher in these high cost cities. But once you start to you know, chip away at that, when you go to post tax and then expenditure and then to consumption, Consumption actually starts to flip the other direction, where their consumption is actually lower in these expensive cities, um, highlighting that their um, the prices just don't fully compensate them for their um, for the higher wages there, and their net consumption is lower for the lower skill households. Finally, the last bit of the paper in my sort of negative one minute, um, we look at the gaps in consumption uh, between all the different these three different skill groups, and then look at how the role of skill sorting and population sorting contribute to this consumption gap. So just as a brief takeaway, we find that the gap in consumption between college graduates and high school graduates, equalizing skill sorting, may, basically making all cities have the nationally representative skill mix, only mitigates the consumption gap between these groups by about 12%. Um, but then when you do equalize population sorting and basically make all cities the same population, so undo the presence of really, really large cities, that mitigates consumption inequality substantially. So high skill people in, high, in large cities are disproportionately benefiting the consumption of the high skill. I have a lot more to say about that, but I don't have time. Just to conclude, we find that expensive cities don't fully compensate low skill workers to um, make it their consumption high enough to make it a the sort of ideal place to live in with respect to consumption, where the so that's for the low skill and the high skill workers really have these wages in high skill cities that offset the prices, making those cities particularly desirable for them. 
And then the sorting we see by skill and by population both contribute to magnifying consumption inequality. And as I said before, we ignore amenities, but we know that amenities are likely to be the nicest in these large high skill cities. Those are also finding, we find also benefiting the high skill in terms of consumption. So if you were to put that on top, it would even further magnify this consumption inequality. So thanks very much. Perfect. Eric is our last discussant. We have a hard stop in about nine and a half minutes. Um, so I'll just let you go. I think you're muted. Perfect. Oh, I shared the wrong one. Hold on one second. You guys are seeing the wrong one. This is my, my technology of coming in slowly. This is the one I want. Boom. Okay. Well, I'm just going to run with this right now. You're good. Okay. So um, are you guys seeing me flip around? I have so many things open or not. Are you yeah, you're good. good. Okay. So the paper covers a lot of ground, explores consumption patterns across uh, income groups and, and, and locations, uh, uses novel data on linked bank account and credit card data, complements analysis uh, with data from a variety of other sources, and there is a tremendous amount of interesting results uh, in, in this paper. So in, in my short amount of time, I thought that there was two components I could have commented on. One is just thinking about this wonderful data linking consumption and income um, and you know how useful that is in a variety of settings. And then the second part is kind of what the paper wants to get at is the spatial variation in consumption across different types of, of households. My sense was Rebecca and Enrico have a tremendous amount of knowledge themselves in the latter. And I wanted to take a few minutes of spending some time uh, on the former, just thinking about this consumption data broadly. And are you guys actually seeing my slides moving or? Yep, yeah, perfect. Yeah, you're okay. fine. Um, so, okay, so we have a snapshot of data from 2014. It has lots of income and has lots of consumption data in it. How well does that data benchmark at, uh, relative to other things we know from a variety of other, both consumption theory and a bunch of other uh, uh, consumption, consumption data sets? And so the paper provides a couple of glimpses of those. And again, these are only inputs into the real thing that they want to get at. But I think it's useful to kind of just ponder how well the, 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 the income data and consumption data um, kind of match uh, what we kind of think we know. So from a large amount of literature using some of it, the consum consumer expenditure survey in the US, which we know has some measurement error problems, but the British household per, uh, panel, the, the, the Italian uh, 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 expenditure survey, the German expenditure survey. So there's a lot of data all that kind of show that consumption inequality and permanent income inequality track each other very closely in these data sets. So if we have good data on consumption and we have good data on income, those two patterns, again, in the time series, this is paper is not about the time series, it's about the cross section, but in the time series, those measures track each other well. And the key is, even though it's not current income that's tracking well with consumption, permanent income does. And so I wanted to show one picture from their paper and then kind of think about how this relates in, in a variety of other, other settings. So this is data on the savings rate in their data varying with current income. And so this comes right from the paper. So on the x-axis is log household income. On the y-axis is the share of consumption in the aggregate, the way that they've measured it, uh, relative to, to income. So numbers greater than one mean people are borrowing. Numbers less than one means people are saving. And how much lower than it is one than one is kind of like the savings rate, if you will. And not surprising, high income people are saving more than low income people in a way that would be consistent with transitory fluctuations in income. So some of these high income people might be temporarily high. And when you're temporarily high, you save some money. When your income is low, we know this is in a steady state when you could, you know, you can't run debt forever. But when your temporary income is low, you will borrow just like, you know, you know, young people do or or, or people who get bad income shocks. So why am I focusing on that? 
I want us to think a little bit, and there are papers who out there who measure savings rates out of permanent income that people could that you could benchmark to, to to kind of get a sense of how much of this income variation is is temporary versus permanent. But what I really want to get to is when we start thinking about getting the price indices right, we want to think about heterogeneity across consumption goods. And that's kind of what Rebecca and, and Enrico spent a lot of great work in the paper trying to figure out the right price indices to kind of deflate, deflate their, their uh, consumption measures are and do that by income group. And so there, there is some literature out there where people have used this heterogeneous consumption data to try to make, make inequality measures, uh, again, in household surveys. But I want to focus on one component of it. The paper has inputs that I think are related to the law. Well, it is large, I mean, the large angle curve literature that is in the consumption side of things. And so this angle curve literature is going to relate spending on a given consumption item as a function of something akin to permanent income. And why do I pause on that is, you know, the literature on necessities and luxuries that are out there, how people's consumption patterns change with income. You know, there are certain goods that people have thought was relatively luxurious and certain goods that people find as necessities, like food at home is tend to be a necessity, things like entertainment tends to be a luxury. And here's a pattern from the British household panel from some work by Richard Blundell, but it's it's in tons of surveys. Aguiar Bills has this in the in in the CEX data, adjusting for measurement error. Patterns very similar to this, which is as we get richer in some permanent income sense, and this is an important total expenditure goes up, our share of spending on a given consumption item, in this case entertainment, goes up. So it's a luxury good. Rebecca and, and Enrico have the same thing in their paper. They, they, it's not in the paper, but they did this and they sent it to me by category by category. Here's the same pattern for entertainment in the, the aggregate data. And so entertainment isn't a luxury good in the data the way they have it, uh, in the sense that, you know, if anything, this get notice the X and the Y axis is small variation. So I would even call this close to neutral, but you don't see the same stark upward sloping patterns as we get richer with uh, with this, it, the levels are about the same, about four percent, three percent, and they're getting numbers like three, three and a half percent throughout. It's just the the relationship with income is different in the aggregate. Before we even get to manipulating and how we're going to use this to make local price indexes, and so you know, the question I want to think about is why is that difference in the estimates there? And it could be the household data sets are wrong. My sense is. That's probably not the case. It shows up in, again, the CES, there's tons of measurement error. The British household panel matches aggregates pretty well. But I think people who have used this angle curve literature notice, realize that there's measurement error in the microdata, and they spend a lot of effort trying to minimize some of that measurement error. So why might that difference be there? I think some of it could be, you know, projecting permanent income versus current income. In, in their paper, Rebecca and, 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 and Enrico could have chess for that instead of just plotting relative to um, um, uh, the, the data. Uh, I think we're almost out of time. Oh my God. I think you're going to time out in about 45 seconds. Okay. So this is what I was basically going to say. But I think one other thing to think about is measurement error in their own data about high income individuals maybe having multiple bank accounts that could be affecting. So. My big kind of thing is, oh, I just want to make one shout out to Jesse's paper. Jesse does a lot of good work uh, on, on cross uh, uh, income group price indexes as, as well. But my last thing is, there's a whole bunch of data here that could be benchmarked to, to the consumption side. I would use that as a first step and then start to move towards some, uh, uh, some of the regional stuff. That was all that was on my mind. I'm sorry, I'm seven minutes is so short. That's Thanks. all I got. Great. <laughs> Thanks to everyone. I think we're going to cut off here in a second. So. Okay. Thanks, Sorry. everyone. Okay. Bye.